Anybody know what this is? It's a tuning fork. It's a tuning fork. What does a tuning fork do? Who knows what a tuning fork does? It tunes. How does a tuning fork tune? You had to hit it on something. I know my, my musicians should know what a tuning fork is. Or anybody that went through band class. For those of you, I don't know if it's going to come pick up on this mic, but. You hear that? All right. It's a tuning fork. All right. I was sitting in service on Sunday, and the Lord said, I want you to go get a tuning fork. And he gave me a very simple principle. It has nothing to do with tonight's lesson, but I thought it was nice, and he told me I should, I should bring it up. I just do what I'm told, ladies and gentlemen. I don't run this thing. See, a tuning fork is made to play a certain tune. Now, this is A. This is 440 megahertz. This is A440. So this is the A above middle C. That's not important. Just know this is A. <laughs> <coughs> It's made to make that very specific tone every time you strike it on something. The harder you strike it, the louder it plays in A440. Okay? And the Lord said this to me. I'm going to try not to bow my head down too much because I got this mic right here. He said, when you're in tune, the harder you're hit, the louder your tune gets. See, a tuning fork can only play one tune because it was made, and it's made out of steel, and it's made to make this very particular sound. And no matter how hard you hit it, it's only going to make this sound because that's the only tune that this fork has. And what happens is, in life, sometimes we get hit and our tune changes. And the harder we get hit, tune changes even more. But we're meant to be like this fork. This will never play another note because it's only made of one, and that's A. And I can hit it as hard as I want, and it's only going to play this note. He said, a believer who's walking in faith is like a tuning fork. When you hit them, their note gets louder. Amen. And the harder you hit them, the louder it gets. Amen. It doesn't change. It doesn't go up in pitch or down in pitch. It never gets out of tune. It stays right where it was made to be. The manufacturer of this little instrument made this to make this one tone. And it didn't program it with any others. You could drop it. You can step on it. You can slam it against any surface. And then there's another little cool thing. Now, I don't have an instrument here, but I think I tested it on this. If you strike a tuning fork, I just might mute it. And you strike it hard enough, and then you touch it to something, everything that it touches will sing the same tune. Now, if I put this on a piano or an acoustic guitar or something, it would be really loud. Because when you're in tune, you will tune the things around you. If your tune doesn't change, when you're hit and you're singing your tune, everything you touch is going to sing your tune. But what happens is our tune fluctuates. So when we get hit, we call our auntie, and we talk fear, doubt, and unbelief with auntie, and she talks that with us for an hour and a half. And then we call our best friend, and we talk doubt, and we talk what's on the news and what's in the weather. And that's a different tune. And then we try to call the pastor and try to talk faith. We got so many different tunes going. We're not affecting anybody around us. Everybody's affecting us. Just be a tuning fork. The harder you hit, sing your tune out. And what's your tune? Well, the Holy Spirit will tell you what your tune is. And you don't change your tune for anything. Didn't say it was easy. But that's why they make these out of metal, because you can't break them. All right. I thought that was nice. That ministered to me as a musician. Now, how do I get into this? 
When we left off last week, I could have stayed two more hours, but my wife wouldn't let me. <laughs> or my mama. My mama wouldn't let me. My wife would. But it's easier to blame you. No, it's not. That's a... I know. I'm, I'm setting myself up. I got to move this microphone because my head is going to be down a lot, and I'm going to brush this thing with my chin every chance. So y'all just give me one second because this is going to be the thing that bothers me tonight, and I need to be able to focus. So bear with me one second. I'm going to put this over here. We'll see. Yeah, that's better. How'd that sound? That sounds pretty good. That'll, that'll function, right? When we left off last week, I left some of y'all with some questions. I like questions because questions means that I've touched an area of ignorance or interest. Either way, questions are good. We have a question box. Well, we had one. I don't know what happened to it. We have a question box somewhere. <laughs> We don't, we don't get too many questions in there. I'm hoping by the end of this series, there will be some questions in the box, online, somewhere, or run up to me after the service. I like answering in person. I don't care. Just have some questions. It's good to have some. But if you have one you think other folks might have, write it down so we can answer it from here. Pastor Diane has been talking about this kingdom, and I have to tell you, I have to tell you that this kingdom preaching has been revolutionary. It's been liberating because religion now I love that point she made about religion being the government of the kingdom of darkness because you never looked at it that way before and if you go back to the Old Testament and you go back through human history you find that the devil always operated through religion and then religion created culture and then culture created human governments and that is true to this day Every modern government is a product of a culture of the people that form that government. And every culture is a product of some religion. So you got entire nations today whose core government was formed on religious ideologies that existed 2,000 years ago that still integrated into the culture of those people. And then those people built a built government around that culture. And that as the value and whatever values were inherent in that religion, those values bleed into everything. Because the devil's always used worship as a means of control. You see, I'm gonna get ahead of myself. So religion in and of itself is of the devil. Now, the word religion can be used in a positive way if you understand it. So don't get too hung up on the terminology. Focus on the signs of religious behavior. Because sometimes when you start saying certain words, people get in their feelings because we've used religion in a, in, a, in, a, in a neutral way to describe Christianity and things like that. And it hasn't always just been negative talking. But the spirit that makes a person religious comes from the devil. That's a better way to put it. That's a better way to put it. The spirit that removes the Holy Ghost from the center and puts a set of customs and ideas in its place, in his place, is of the devil. Even if those customs and ideas are meant to be the worship of God. Because you're not worshiping God absent of the Holy Spirit. You can sing a song with Jesus in the lyrics. You can come to a building with a cross on top of it. You can engage in the rituals of the service, all in the service of the Christian God, and still not be worshiping God. Because the worship of God begins and ends with the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he is the single... Important isn't the right word. One, because it's too small, but also because it isn't a perfect representation of his value to us. And I don't want to misrepresent him. I was going to say he's the most important member of the Godhead to us today. But important really isn't the best word. It's just the only one that's coming to my mind. And what I mean by that is this. In the Old Testament, prior to Jesus, the most important member of the Godhead was the Father. 
And any time the father wanted to communicate or do anything with people, he would have to do one of two things. He'd have to send an angel or have to come himself. There's a, there's a, a, a chapter in Genesis where he visits Abraham before they destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, he and two angels visit Abraham in the flesh. And Abraham recognizes him and entreats him per their Middle Eastern custom. And then the, then the two angels go on to Sodom and Gomorrah and burn it down. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. But then Jesus is born. And when Jesus was in the flesh in the earth, the most important member of the Godhead in the earth was Jesus. Any contact you were going to have with God was going to be directly through contact with Jesus. There were no more prophets. The priests weren't talking to God anymore. It was Jesus. Jesus was the man. If you wanted to get close to God or get access to the kingdom of God, you had to find Jesus himself. He was the most important member of the Godhead at that period in history. Then Jesus left and sent the Holy Spirit. And that's the dispensation, that's the era that we live in now, where the Holy Spirit is the most important member of the Godhead to us today because he returns us to the way we were in the garden. He returns us to the state of being that Adam had prior to his fall because Adam was the spirit of God breathed into flesh and given form. And his connection to God is what made him a living soul. And when he sinned, he disconnected himself from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lifted from him and left him. That's why his anointing left. The Holy Spirit is the anointing. You're not anointed without the Holy Ghost. The anointing manifested in the Old Testament clouds of smoke and things like that. But it was always an act of the Holy Spirit. It was always a Holy Spirit ordained activity. We're looking for clouds of smoke and things like that now. And that's great. But we have something so much better. We have the actual Holy Spirit living inside of us. Amen. And we neglect him and then we come to church and wait for the pastor to preach down a cloud of smoke. <laughs> we want to praise down a cloud of smoke. But you wouldn't know what to do in a cloud of smoke except cough. I'd rather attend to the Holy Spirit in me on a daily basis because it's such a privilege, you take it for granted, like most privileges. Most privileges are taken for granted until you don't have them anymore. See, Adam took his privilege for granted and ate the fruit. Then he lost the Holy Spirit and realized that without him, he was nothing but flesh, and his flesh was naked. And so his fear came upon him, and he ran. Jesus never took the Holy Spirit for granted, which is why he was with him all the way to the cross. And he didn't leave him until he became us. And then the Holy Spirit left him. And for the first time in Jesus' life, he realized what it was like to be a naked man without the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit couldn't go into hell with him. Jesus had to go as sin. He had to surrender himself to death. In order to die, you can't have the Holy Spirit in you or you'll never die. See, God told Adam in the garden, if you eat this fruit, you will surely die. The prerequisite for death is to be absent from the Holy Spirit. It's got nothing to do with flesh. The prerequisite for death is separation from the Holy Ghost. That's why everybody who was unsaved is dead. In the spirit, they're dead because there's no Holy Ghost in them. When Jesus resurrected, he came to his disciples and he breathed the Holy Ghost into them. And then they became alive. And these are the only living people on the planet at this point. Everybody else was dead. Animated flesh does not mean you're alive. It just means there's a dead spirit because death does not mean non-existent. You will never cease to exist. You're going to exist somewhere forever. You've got to change your definition of death. When we think of death, we think of somebody's body falling to the ground and their spirit leaving their body and then you've got a hunk of flesh. Let me explain something to you. That is not the definition of death. The death of the body is not the death of the person. The death of the person is when they are separate from the Holy Spirit. Just like the person becomes alive when they receive the Holy Spirit and become born again into life, the Bible says. 
into new life. Now you are a living person, regardless of the condition of your body, which is why when your person's body dies, but they were born again, their living self goes to be with the Lord. Because that's where all life originated. That's where all life returns. But if they were separated from the Holy Spirit when their body dies, they go to hell. Because that's where all death goes. And all dead things end up there. Does that make sense? I'm taking my time. I'm trying to, because sometimes you kind of go kind of fast and you jump over things. You think people understand. I'm sure everybody understands. Life and death have nothing to do with the condition of your body. Life and death have everything to do with the, con the condition of your spirit. Amen. If your spirit is one with the Holy Spirit, it is alive. Amen. Thank you for that. <laughs> if your spirit is separated from the Holy Spirit, it is dead. God told Adam, in the day you eat the fruit, you will die. He didn't say anything about his body. He wasn't talking about his body. He didn't care about his body in that respect. He's talking spirit to spirit. He said, you and I will be separated, and I am the source of life. Without me, there is no life. So if you separate from me, you are dead. And that's what he was explaining to him. The serpent lied and said, you won't die. We won't surely die. Mm -hmm. It's worth the risk, Adam. Eat the fruit. It's worth the risk. He knew what would happen, but he lied because what he does. And he's good at it. Now, I laid that foundation because I want to make sure that as I'm going tonight, that we're all on the same page. I don't like, I don't mind questions, but I don't like confusion. If you're confused about something, then I want to dig and make sure that we hit it. Because I can do this for the rest of the year and on to next year. I can stay on this subject for years if I have to. As a teacher, I have two responsibilities. One, to do whatever the Holy Ghost tells me to do but two, to make sure that I have not neglected the responsibility of teaching this in a way that as many of you can receive it, have an opportunity to receive it. So I can teach it 20 different ways until everybody gets it. Because it'd be nice to have a new sermon every week. That's what religion tells the pastor they have to do. You don't teach the same thing twice because people will get bored and fall asleep or leave and go somewhere else. And then you have people in rooms hearing wonderful, entertaining messages, and they're not getting anything. But that's not my commission. That's not Pastor Diana's commission. We will stand on the same scripture and preach it for a year straight if that's what the Holy Ghost tells us to do, because it's about breakthrough. Tonight, let's talk about the covenant of sin. And I'm going to preface this with a, with a little bit of a recap about those three heavens. Those three heavens keep opening up, and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. But I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Because the covenant of sin is an important part of our history. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start there. Let's look at the moment that the covenant was made, and let's look at what the ramifications of the covenant were. Because the question has been asked, why did Jesus have to die for us to be saved? And we know, that we know all of the things about sacrifice and slaying of lambs and, and all of that, but why? That was the method. But why was, that, why was that necessary? Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And people have read that and said, well, see, it was a snake, because he said it was more subtle than any beast of the field. But you have to understand the language being used here. There's only three types of beings on the planet at this time. There's man, there's animals, and then there's a serpent. That's it. The spirits. I had to jump a little bit. Let's do this. See, every time I go somewhere, I get stuck somewhere. And it's y'all's fault. Because I would love to just go through this thing as I, as, I, as I picture it. But 
The Bible says that angels are spirits. This is everything we need to know about angels. This is Angels 101. All right. What is an angel? We said last week that they're not just human-looking dudes with wings. That's the word angel simply means, so the word angel in the, in the Latin and in the Hebrew actually just means messenger. That's all it means. It doesn't have a bigger meaning than that, the word angel. It just means messenger. If you've ever seen the word evangelist, the word angel is in the middle of the word evangelist because they have the same root. And, it, and an evangelist is someone that God gives a message to, and then they go out and they preach that message to everywhere they can go. That's all an evangelist is. Well, angel is just Latin for messenger. The Bible says the devil has angels. Right? So don't think of angels simply as big guys with big wings. There's a, there's a type of angel that has wings, but there are many that don't. So don't try to lock them into a certain image because artists over the centuries have only drawn angels one way. The Bible describes angels as ministering spirits. The word minister just means administrating. This is what the Bible calls angels. And it's more important to go by what the Bible says than by what Michelangelo said. Amen. Okay. Michelangelo drew some angels, Da Vinci drew some angels, everybody drew some angels, and they all drew them one way because they were pretty, and they made them look like Italian men, right? Because they were Italian. If we drew angels, they'd be black. No, just don't lie. <laughs> somebody, got, somebody got a black angel in their house right now. If, <laughs> I didn't, you didn't have to raise your hand, but I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> it was a gift. It was a gift. <laughs> as they tend to be. <laughs> Somebody's out here buying them and then giving them to the, 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 all their saved friends. I don't know who it is. But. <laughs> the Bible calls them ministering spirits. The word ministering simply means administrative. I'm not writing that word. I know how to spell it, but I don't like writing on this board. It's going to get uglier as that goes. Deal with it. The English word ministry just means administrator. Everybody in here either deals with some kind of administration or is in administration. If you're a secretary, that's an administrative job. If you're an accountant, that's an administrative job. If you're an HR, that's an administrative job, right? If you're a manager or anything, most companies have administration. Somebody's handling the day-to-day -day affairs to keep the company running smoothly. That's all administrative means. The other meaning for minister is servant. This is an important one. Y'all laughing, I know y'all are, but I don't care. <laughs> my handwriting is ugly anyway, so my whiteboard handwriting is going to be even worse. Just deal with it. The other main meaning of the word minister is servant. A minister unto someone tends to be a servant unto that person. It was more commonly used in the old the old English, you know, a servant might be called a minister to the king or a minister to this prince or a minister to someone. Even the word minister, when referred to pastor, teacher, apostle, private evangelist, means servant. Because, see, in the church, now I'm passing in a talk this, the church is, has an administrative function in the kingdom of God. So it's full of ministers. And the leaders in the church, the apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, are ministers in both senses. We have administrative responsibilities. We have to manage the souls of the people, as well as the affairs of the church in the earth. And we also have to serve. When you call your pastor at 4 o'clock in the morning because your kid is in jail, we have to serve that need, even though we'd rather be asleep. When, when the neighborhoods fall into pieces, people go to the church to see what's the pastor going to do. That's a servant position. Okay, so the word minister in every term means a servant or an administrator. Everybody get that? The Bible also says that angels are ministering spirits to us. So every angel made 
has an automatic responsibility to serve us and to administer over those things which concern us. Does that make sense? The Bible says in Psalms 91 that God gave his angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. To protect us in our ways, God's angels, God's ministering spirits, protect us. He gave them that responsibility. Now, in that second heaven is where the angelic activity happens. It's where it happened in the past. It's where it happens now. This, this little eraser is going to take forever. Y'all know what I'm getting ready to draw. I'm about to draw them heavens for the fourth time, third or fourth time. But it's important because I find that people learn visually, myself included. But I'm going to draw it fast because I ain't got all that. I ain't got all night. One, two, three. Actually, three, two, one. See, I made it easy. Write all them words, right? All power originates in heaven number three. This is where God sits. That's God's name. That's his proper name. In Hebrew, that's his proper name. It's, it's unpronounceable, actually, but attempts are made at pronouncing it. Normally, we English folks put vowels in there to make it pronounceable, and we call them Yahweh. You've heard these people calling them Yah. For all, you, for all you black Hebrews that came up with your own religion, the actual Hebrews don't call them Yah. It's just, we just got to make everything a little cooler sounding. Uh, but for, interestingly enough, the word hallelujah is actually two words. It's actually not a word. It's a, it's a command. Hallelu is Hebrew for worship. And then Yah is shorthand for Yahweh. So it actually, when you hear the word hallelujah, someone's actually telling you to worship God. It's not a word in and of itself. It's two words put together. Uh, but I mean is one word. <laughs> uh, all power originates here. And then it is administered here. So it flows from here. And all angelic activity, remember what I said about angels, don't just think of guys with wings. Think of all spirits. All non-earth spirits have a job here. Okay? And then here is where it all manifests. And that's where we live. We live in the realm where we can see the first heaven. We look up, we can see that. Because God called that heaven. He called the sky heaven. Outer space is heaven. Anything we can observe, not earth, is heaven. The stellar heavens is a common term used for it. This is, the, this is invisible, and this is only visible if you're invited. Okay? <laughs> we'll all get to see this heaven, but we don't belong here. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Why? Because there was no place for us here. He said, I have to go and prepare a place for you here. Prior to Jesus, when people died, they went down here. This is not a cuss word. It's a place. <laughs> Everybody went there because nobody, regardless of how faithful you were to God, belonged up here. There was no place for them. Only living beings can go to, to heaven number three. Dead people can't go to heaven number three. All dead things go to hell. It's just the way it is. Okay? So if you were faithful to God, but you were not born again, because you couldn't be born again before Jesus, right? If you were not born again when you died, you went to hell. But there was a place in hell where you were reserved or preserved from punishment. Because the rest of hell is a horrible place. So God set a place of hell aside where you could go. It was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. But it was just called paradise because Abraham went there. Didn't become his bosom until later, right? 
The Hebrew called it, the Hebrew called it Abraham's bosom, but what was it called before Abraham? I don't know. It was all hell to them, but it wasn't all torturous. However, you could observe the tortures of others. Jesus talks about that with Lazarus and the rich man, right? That's not a parable, by the way. He's not, that's not a parable. Lazarus, that's, not, that's Jesus actually telling of an event that happened. Jesus would use parables, stories, to illustrate certain points. But then sometimes he would tell you something that happened. Lazarus and the rich man is not a parable, it's a story. This is the hierarchy of the universe. All power flows from here, and then it is dispersed through the administration of heaven number two. So God put his ministering spirits in heaven number two to administer by his will, his power, down to this realm where we live. Okay? Everybody gets that. Lucifer had a job here in heaven number two. He was one of the chief angels in heaven number two. Now, there's a, nothing in my line. Did I accidentally erase my line? Now, there's an, there's an interesting, Ephesians chapter 6 says the following. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, mm -hmm. powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I ain't got to turn to it. I can quote it. The word principality means a territory ruled over by a prince. Right? That's what a principality is. He's talking about heaven number two. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. He calls it high places because it's above ours. It's above our location. Okay. In Daniel chapter 12, Michael the archangel. Who's familiar with Michael the archangel? Who's heard of Michael? Raise your hand if you've heard of Michael the archangel. Okay. Michael the archangel is mentioned in the Bible. And in Daniel chapter 12, he's called a great prince. You see, Michael is an angel. And he's an angel with authority. But he's referred to as a prince because he has authority in this second heaven. But unlike Lucifer, Michael remained faithful to God. So he's one of God's angels who God used heavily in the Old Testament to administer his will on the earth. He would send Michael to do things. Remember when Daniel prayed to the Lord and it took three weeks for him to get an answer? Gabriel is another one of God's archangels who stayed faithful. Gabriel got Daniel's answer from heaven number three, sent down to heaven number two, and he went, he went to work. But there's two factions of angels in heaven number two. Those who align with Lucifer and those who stayed aligned with God. So Gabriel just can't go down here and give the answer to Daniel right away, even though he had it right away. He has to battle through these principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of the world. Gabriel had to do it. Couldn't do it alone, so he got help from Michael. And the Bible calls Michael a great prince. And Michael and Michael's armies come and back up Gabriel. And they break through the resistance in heaven number two. And they come down to heaven number one and then to earth. And they bring Daniel his answer. Okay? So when we see, especially in the Old Testament, we see talk of different princes and kings. Sometimes it's talking about human beings. Sometimes it's talking about angels, because these are also referred to as princes and kings. So you have to know when you're talking, because in the spirit realm, there's rank. And you have princes and kings in this realm that operate according to a hierarchy. They got angels under them. They got spirits under them. OK, does that make sense? When Lucifer began his rebellion, it didn't happen all at one time. First, he recruited a third of the administrating spirits in heaven number two. He recruited them to his rebellion because he couldn't do it on his own. If he was going to run things, he was going to need a kingdom. He was going to need a group of capable spirits 
to administer his kingdom. All demonic activity, all demonic activity is just the actions of those spirits operating according to the will of the devil and his kingdom. That's what a demon is. Now, there's some people say they're disembodied spirits from the past. That's not true. That's apocryphal because disembodied spirits ain't floating around getting in other people's bodies. That's not, I've heard it, I've heard it in otherwise well-informed anointed circles, but the Bible has no evidence for that. That a whole group of people died and then their spirits became demons and then they take over people and stuff, you know, they're right here. The Bible already tells you the devil has his angels. And we know what an angel is. It's just a spirit. It does not mean the devil has an army of guys with wings. It just means he has an army of spirits that spread his message and that use his tactics to influence the acts of man. That's what a demon does. In the Old Testament, they had free reign because their authority, Adam's authority, was given to them. So they could do things without reserve, except when a higher order was given. Because even though they were in rebellion, they still don't have power over all. So what God does, where's my, where's, where's my thing? And notice I'm giving you a scripture of everything I say, because if people just start coming up with theories and they can't back it up with scripture, you can take it or leave it. Sometimes it's right, but they gotta be able, you got to be able to line it up with, with the word of God. Otherwise, it's not relevant, right? If you can't line it up with the word, you don't have to believe it. But you must believe whatever the word of God says. If you don't understand the word, the Holy Spirit will give you understanding. Yes, will. But you are responsible for believing the word. Because sometimes this stuff gets a little out there and you go, wait a minute. So I'll give you scripture. So you can go home and get your own revelation. God makes man in his image and after his likeness. And the Bible says God gave the man dominion over the works of his hands. All the works of his hands, from three and down, God gave man dominion over. Don't get caught up on location. If you live in Florida, Washington, D.C. is above you on a map. Is that right? Because it's north of you. If the president moves to Florida, is he still the president? He's not below Washington, D.C. He's still the highest seat of power in the country, even though he's located south of D.C. He's not the president because he sits in the big chair in the Oval Office. He's the president because of who he is. His office goes with him wherever he's located. So even though we're located here, we're still above this. It's government. And the structure of the government means man is second only to God. The Bible says that what is man that thou has knowledge of him and that thou visitest him. Thou hast made him a little lower than yourself, a little lower than Elohim, and crowned him with glory and honor and given him authority over all the works of your hands. The angels make that comment because up until the creation of man, it was God, angels, and the earth. Then God made man, and man went up here. and had authority over number two, just like God did. And angels were like, well, what is that? He looks just like you. You positioned him, you located him physically down here, but his power and authority comes from way up here. We didn't issue it to him. We didn't administer it to him. We have our hierarchy in heaven number two. We know who that prince is. We know, we know Michael's a prince. We know Gabriel's a prince. We know Lucifer's a prince. We know these guys. And they've got guys under them, and they got guys on their level. But you made somebody that just supersedes all of them, and you made him like you. And then you went and lived inside of him. What is that? 
That's the question. You are something. Man is something we've never seen before because you've never inhabited flesh before. You've delegated, but to come down here and live in this dimension, for you to live in this dimension, this man must be special. And Lucifer said, I want that. So he rallied a number of the workers in heaven number two to his cause. And then he made his trip down here and formed a covenant with man. Now, God tells man in Genesis chapter two not to eat the fruit. In Genesis chapter three, we see the serpent. He said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That's a leading question. He's just, he's just opening her up. He wants, he, wants, he wants her to talk. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, we shall not eat of it, neither shall we touch it, or we'll die. And the serpent said, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, the word God, God is not God's name. We call him God. Jesus called him Father. But the word God just means someone that is supreme above someone else. It's a title. Our God is the one true God above all gods. He alone has that title. But God is not his name. Just like I can worship Ben as a god, the god of great facial hair. <laughs> but his name is still Ben. <laughs> his name doesn't become God, even if I worship him. Anything you worship becomes God to you. So what the devil is offering the woman and the man in this moment is an opportunity to be worshipped. He says you can be an object of worship, knowing good, which is whatever God says, and evil. Now what is their perception of what evil is? See, we are accustomed to, we're accustomed to the word evil meaning bad things happening because that's the result of evil bad things happening. Well, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be much of a sales pitch if he promised them bad things would happen. He wouldn't, he wouldn't offer them bad things. He's never offered you anything bad. The devil's never offered you anything bad. When he said, man, that girl looked good, you need to go talk to her. You won't think of nothing bad. What's going to happen? <laughs> the fact that she ended up pouring bleach on your clothes and setting your house on fire, <laughs> if you knew that was going to happen, you would never talk to that girl. Let's just be honest. When he told you to drink that last fifth, and get behind the wheel of that car, you didn't see yourself driving off a cliff. You just saw yourself having a good time. Because the devil never offers you anything bad. So evil, as we define it, has to be re-understood. What he's offering them is the chance to do something outside of the will of God. Because that's the definition of evil. We know what good is. God is good. So evil is anything outside of God. You get to know what it's like outside of God. It ain't so bad, man. It's not so bad. Eat the fruit. You will become worshipped as a God, and you will be outside of whatever God's got you doing. And that's what he offered him. That's why the man's sin was so egregious, because he wasn't tricked into it. He knew exactly what he was getting himself into. But he wanted to experience life outside of the will of God. That's what evil is. Now, all the bad stuff that happens as a result of evil was free to take place. Go to, very quickly, Romans chapter 5. Now, Pastor Diana took us there, and she jumped the gun on me because she tends to do it. I'm just playing. Technically, the person who started preaching first is, uh, is, is her, so... You know, I, I'm always kind of jumping on her. Romans chapter 5, because she's been preaching, you know, years longer than I have, obviously. Romans chapter 5, go to verse 12. 
Wherefore, as one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Paul says that Adam's one, Adam was the guy who invited death into the world through sin. So Adam went to sin. He didn't go to die. Just like you go to sin, you don't go to die. Adam invited in sin, and then sin brought death with it. Adam, see, the serpent told the woman, you shall not die. Because if he had told her, yeah, you'll die, but it'll feel good, she wouldn't have took it. What they thought, what she thought would happen, was I'm going to eat this fruit, I'm going to stay how I am, and I'm going to add something to me I didn't have before. I'm going to get to experience this evil and still be what I am. When God said, you will die, you will stop being what you are, and you will become a dead thing. So he didn't promise them, the devil didn't promise them death, he promised them sin. And they took the sin. And death brought sin with, I mean, sin brought death with it. And then all of us came out dead. For until the law, and I'm going to skip ahead, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, verse 14, even over them that had not sinned the same way Adam sinned. Verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. That's a Hebrew argument that I'll have to get into later. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, death reigned. The word reign is important there. Because the thing that was, that was ruling over the earth after Adam brought sin in was death. Everybody was afraid of death. They worshiped death. They did everything as a result of death. Death took over as the obsession of mankind. We created death everywhere we went. We feared death everywhere we went. We didn't fear death before. Before sin, we didn't fear death. Death had no power. But then death reigned. Verse 18, therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, talking about Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So here's Paul's testimony here. Let me see, what am I looking at? Come on. I have two minutes. I'm right back where I was last week. So here's what happens. The serpent offers a covenant to man. He says, you will get to experience the pleasure of sin. And I want your flesh. He said, I want your flesh. Here's why. The power of an administrative spirit is always delegated by God or a God like us. They have no expression outside of that. They can have thoughts and ideas, but they cannot have expression. When you see a person addicted to a substance, let's say alcohol, what you are actually seeing is a person expressing the addiction of a spirit to that sensation. When you see a person engaged in fornication or lust, and they just can't seem to get it off their mind, what you are seeing is a person under the influence of a spirit who is consumed with lust. You see, every negative, sinful action and feeling that we wrestle against is the personality of a spirit unchecked by a God kind. That's why when Jesus met the madman of Gadara, and he had all those demons in him, and he cast them out of the man, they had to go kill something. 
They didn't just go, well, maybe next time. These were not calm spirits doing a job. These were corrupted angels, maddened by the touch of sin that had corrupted them to such a point that they had to kill. They had to be violent. They had to do something. But their power is always regulated by a God kind or by God himself. So what? So if Lucifer wanted to have free reign to allow himself and his angels to express themselves, somebody had to give him access to flesh, to their flesh. And through that access, he could run the world. So he comes to the man. I know I'm jumping over just a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. You're going to teach it better on Sunday anyway. That's why y'all got to come back. He had to give. He had to get access to the man's flesh. So the man says, you can have my flesh. I want sin. That's a covenant. And the man gave his flesh to sin. That's the covenant he cut with sin. Now, the only way to end that covenant, so here's the thing. You can't end a covenant. You can create a new one, but you can't end an old one. So Jesus has to be made in the flesh of man, but made like how Adam was made. Formed in flesh, but spirit from God. And then he has to give his flesh to form a new covenant that people can choose. That's right. This is why he has to die. Because the Bible calls him the last Adam. Because he's the last man who has to die for Adam's sin. After Jesus, no one else has to die for Adam's sin. You can choose to, because you can choose to keep on with Adam's covenant, which is still at work in the earth. People die and go to hell every day. Because they choose Adam's covenant over the new one that Jesus established for us. Because Jesus didn't make the old covenant go away. He gave us a new covenant so that we could decide which covenant we would choose. If we choose Jesus's, we become like him. If we choose Adam's, we stay like Adam. Very simple stuff. Then the devil, and I'm backing up as I say this. To make sure he could get maximum expression, he established religion. All demonic worship in the Old Testament was centered around a, a worship of some god. He would put a demon in a spot. One was named Baal. One was named Asherah. One was named uh, uh, Dagon. These were demonic spirits. They had names. And they wanted to express themselves. So Asherah was a fornication spirit. She loved fornication. And everybody that worshiped her did it through fornication and prostitution. So to express herself, she could use the flesh of her worshipers. So here's the question of the evening that I will leave with you. What demon gets to express himself through your religion? Because their tactics didn't change. They still use religion to express themselves. Some people's religion is their race. They're so black or Asian or Hispanic or whatever or white that they will commit any level of atrocity in the name of their race. Some people's religion is their money. The Bible calls that greed. But it's a demonic spirit expressing itself through something you worship. You got to be mindful. I'll pick up there next week. Yep. <laughs> Part one, again, Pastor Diana. <laughs> She's going to come back and teach this better than I did tonight. I just know it. No. Same Holy Spirit. I'm going to get the rest of this on Sunday while she's teaching, and then I'm going to come back on Wednesday. So y'all just hang on. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. I know I went a little over time, but there's no time in the spirit, so I'm still good. Father, I thank you. <laughs> 
for your Holy Spirit teaching us, leading us, guiding us, enlightening us with revelation knowledge that only you can give. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be, to be awakened to the revelation of the kingdom of God and our place in it. We thank you so much for revealing these things to us so that we can walk with you and walk like you, both in this earth and in all the heavens, which are ours by right. So we thank you, Lord, that as we leave this place, but never your presence. We are reminded of your promise of divine protection in Psalms 91, that you've given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, and they bear us up in their hands. We thank you that we're divinely protected from all hurt, harm, danger, injury, death, damage, sickness, disease, or any work of the evil one until we come again together on Sunday to worship, praise, tithe, give, and to be fed the uncompromised word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. And we don't want you to miss when we go live again. So if you live in the United States, sign up for Rapture Go. Text Rapture to 757-780-4949. And we'll send you a text message every time we go live. If you live outside the United States, then subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook so you never miss one of our live broadcasts. We thank you for watching. God bless you.